We are in Shenandoah, the coal region of Pennsylvania, and this town and this region is unique in that it was known as Vilnius of America because there were simply so many Lithuanians here, perhaps a quarter of the population was Lithuanian at one time. And I am talking to Anne Tchaikovsky Skirmantas, uh, who is like a local historian. She wrote a book about the town and about the local Lithuanians. And uh, the local Lithuanian community here is especially old. The Lithuanians started immigrating here in the mid 19th century or late 19th century. So it was actually the first Lithuanian community of this size outside of the Lithuania proper. So, how was the life in Shenandoah at the time? My grandparents who came here had talked about how difficult it was. For the most part, most of them didn't speak English. They spoke two or three languages. Uh, they may have spoken uh, Polish, and they spoke Lithuanian, and they spoke English, but they did not speak English so well, so it was difficult, and they didn't get the jobs. They ended up being laborers. My grandmother, who was born in 1892, the, the family story was that she was the first child baptized in the St. George Church, which was the Saint, first Lithuanian parish in the United States. She would talk about what it was like walking on the streets, and the streets were made, uh, the sidewalks were made of wood, and what the sound would be in the wood. So I heard some of those stories, and I also heard some of the stories about what it was like for the Lithuanians to come over here, most of them started off working as miners. Things were bad around the Tsarist time. And so in order for them to leave, there were people that actually waited for them by the border. And they were smuggled because they didn't have passports or papers. And they would come then by, uh, go to Bremen or they would come to Hamburg in Germany. And then they would take, at first, sailboats to the United States and then steamships. Terrible journeys here. And when they'd get to New York, there would be people from the coal company from this area. And the first thing they would say to them is, well, we can give you a job. We can give you a place to live. We can set up your life. You just have to come with us. What they didn't realize was how difficult it was going to be being a miner, being a, a mine laborer. It was a very hard life. They died very young. My grandfather died in 40. Most women around here were widows and they had to start with other jobs, doing other things, just to support their children and their families. Most of the mines around here had closed around the 1920s, 1930s. They really weren't working anymore, but by the time I was, I was young, in the 1960s, there were still men who had been miners for years, who the effects of the mine, the black lung, miner's asthma, was still affecting them. And there was a man who lived right across the street from us here. I remember as a child going over, he would sit on his porch during the day, and he always had a handkerchief. And he would cough into the handkerchief, and my parents would be talking to him and the family, but I would look at the handkerchief and there were pieces, it was like a black dust, but it, it was almost like you could see the crystals in there, and that was the coal. And I remember seeing that for a couple of years as I was a child, and then I remember one time I was over there, and again my parents were talking to him, and I was just standing there, and again he coughed, only this time instead of being just black, it also had red in it, and uh, he didn't live much longer after that. I remember the Breaker Boys and how some of them didn't have fingers. I think that's what the difficulty when they first came over here, being the mine laborers, being the Breaker Boys, was what really pushed them to have an education for our generation. And when we had the generation that had the college educations, nobody worked in the mines anymore. I also heard there were a lot of uh, bars or taverns here in the area. What could you tell about that? The story that I'd always heard that in Shenandoah, there was a bar on every corner and one in the middle. My father, uh, when he came home from World War II, uh, one of the ways to support himself was he would gather the liquor licenses for the town in order to process them. And he said that there were over 200 liquor licenses just in the one square mile. In our area, there were quite a few Lithuanians that owned bars. The bars weren't necessarily the way we think of bars. It was almost more of a British pub. It was a place where people would go at first. It was where the miners would go. And it would be where the miners actually would go 
to get washed. The married men would go home and their wives would be able to wash the dirt off of them, but the single men would have no way of getting the coal dirt. And coal dirt isn't just dust. It actually is uh, almost an oil to it. So when it gets on your skin, there would be no way to clean it. So you would actually go in the bar, and this was in the time of the, the turn of the century, and you would have somebody who would wash your back. You would take off your shirt just before you could go home because there was so much of the coal dirt that was already into your skin. Down in this part of town, there were far more Lithuanian bars. In another section of town, there were Irish bars. It was very popular to drink, of course, when you could speak your own language. You wanted to be able to, to talk to people, usually minors, and then already by the time it was my age, it was a little bit different. For the most part, it was beer, it wasn't hard liquor, it was almost never vodka because vodka was considered to be Russian and not too many Lithuanians ever wanted anything that was Russian. When they left it, they didn't want to be called Russian, they would actually get upset because they were Lithuanian. It didn't matter if they were considered citizens of the Tsar. My grandfather's papers has him listed as a citizen of the Tsar, but he would never want to be called Russian, he wanted to be Lithuanian. Miners' life here was especially hard compared to the life of laborers today, and uh, even children worked as coal breakers uh, from quite an early age. Despite of that, there was life uh, beyond the work, like uh, Lithuanians made it up, up to a quarter of the population here, but there were other ethnic groups as well, and uh, they would have their own districts and uh, bars and so on. So how would that life go on uh, and after miners' work, uh, and how do you remember it from your childhood? Schuylkill County in general, as you mentioned, was the, the first wave. Most of them came here. But when they came here, most of their lives centered around the church. And the communities around here had Lithuanian Catholic churches. There were also Slovak and Ukrainian and Polish Catholic churches. It was very important when you started off to go to someone for birth and for death. So there were also Lithuanian funeral directors. There were also Lithuanian storekeepers and lawyers and everything like that. The majority, actually, of Lithuanians who came here went to New Philadelphia. That was the greatest population of Lithuanians. Shenandoah, however, had the first uh, Lithuanian Catholic parish. The traditions were very important. So starting with the 1960s, what I remember, the 1960s, the 1970s, our grandparents passed on to us the tradition of kuchos. Kuchos was very important. So the night before Christmas, you were Lithuanian. Christmas Day, you were all American. You had the plastic toys with, with chocolate and whatever. Same thing with Easter. Usually beforehand, you would do the Easter eggs. You would, everything was, you would go to church. Uh, a lot of uh, things were still said in Lithuanian even back then. But then the next day, Easter, chocolate bunnies, very American. So it was important for our families to have us be Americans, but it was also important that we didn't forget the traditions. We didn't forget the old ways. And I think because our families came over in the first wave, our traditions are really old. From when I was in Lithuania, I believe our traditions are older than the ones that they now practice in Lithuania. They've kind of modernized them. Kuchos may have the same 12 dishes, but unless you go to the country, you are not going to get the really old fashioned way of doing it which we had here putting the straw under the table doing, although my mother would never do poppy seed milk for her, that was just a little bit too much. But it was remembering the old ways, although they didn't have us learn Lithuanian, that wasn't a tradition they passed forward. What they passed forward was a love of the arts, a love of education, and um, a strong love of the church. So you were growing up in the 60s, uh, basically, so it was already almost a hundred years uh, since the first uh, waves of immigration uh, here, and um, about 60 years since your own family immigrated to, to uh, Shenandoah area, so it was already quite a long time has passed uh, and uh, the traditions were still being passed on. And as far as I understand, as for the language, uh, like at least the first generation born here would learn the language, yes. And uh, mm -hmm. the second generation, when did uh, the language start like disappearing, uh, Lithuanian language from the area? 
Oh, I think you're right. It was the second generation. Um, the generation that came over, of course, they spoke Lithuanian and some Polish, and also some Yiddish. Uh, even if they were Catholic, uh, they knew enough German, Yiddish, so that they were able to, to speak with uh, the Lithuanian uh, Jewish population here. Then um, my parents' generation, which would be the first generation born here, uh, they had learned some Lithuanian uh, from their families, but for the most part, they go to school. They didn't really learn it in school, even though there was a Lithuanian school. In fact, my mother said she first learned all of her prayers in Lithuanian, it wasn't until she became a teenager she realized she was saying the wrong things because she had just learned it by listening to other people. By the time it was my generation, we knew little words. We may have picked up little pronunciations or things that our grandparents would say. We would hear them, but we did not learn the language at all. Lithuanians in this area established very many institutions like Lithuanian churches, Lithuanian parish schools and Lithuanian cemeteries. In the entire Pennsylvania coal region there were some 30 Lithuanian churches and uh, even more Lithuanian cemeteries. Uh, what do you think were the reasons for that, why they needed these hubs and uh, especially not only in life but even after death to be buried separately from other ethnic communities? They wanted to practice religious freedom and they did not have that in Tsarist Russia. Again, I'm talking about the first wave. Um, they wanted the freedom to do what they wanted to do in their way and because they didn't have it, I think it became more precious here. If you're denied something, when you finally do get it, it becomes very important to you. So when they first came over, it was a unity, it felt like home. I had heard a story from somebody, a friend of the family, at the time when I was talking to him, he was already in his 90s, and he talked about his mother, who had come over here from Lithuania. She was Catholic. Uh, she happened to be on the main street, just walking down, and Saul Levitt, the man, who, uh, a Jewish man who owned the jewelry store, came running out to give her a hug. He had recognized her from the village. They came from the same village back in Lithuania. There was a feeling of belonging, and that's why the clubs, you could go and talk about what it was like. Here in town, they had a Catholic war veterans group that was all Lithuanians who came from St. George. We used to call it the CWV, Catholic war veterans, but it was actually Lithuanian Catholic war veterans that would meet together. They went through a lot of the same experiences, and this was a place where they could gather to just be friendly with each other. The same thing, whether it was Lithuanian bars, the women, in order to support the Lithuanian uh, sisters of St. Casmer, they belonged to the Sodality. So it was a support group, it was a group to, who understood you. As far as the Lithuanian cemeteries, actually all of the cemeteries in town were ethnic. The first cemetery that we had that was Lithuanian here in Shenandoah had started off with the German church. Well, the Germans left the area to go to someplace else. The Lithuanians were able to take over the cemetery and also were able to take over their school because they were there in the next generation to come through. Then there were, as I said, the Slovaks, the Italians, the Ukrainians. They each had their own cemetery. It's even that way today. People rarely will say, oh, uh, which cemetery? Oh, I'm in St. Michael's. They say, oh, I'm in the Ukrainian or, oh, my family's over in the Irish. And that was still the way we do that. There are more Lithuanian cemeteries in Shenandoah than cemeteries of any other ethnic group, I think. So six cemeteries, which just shows how important Lithuanian culture is to the Shenandoah and its area. In the area beyond that, there are even more Lithuanian cemeteries and churches. And we have marked all of them on map.lithuania.com map. Uh, there you can see their images and read their stories. And I always feel that while Chicago, for example, is uh, the most famous as the uh, Lithuanian capital of America. Even before Chicago, there was Shenandoah. And uh, even today, it has uh, almost as many sites to visit uh, related to Lithuania and Lithuanian history as Chicago does. So it's, and it's just two and a half hour from New York City, so a lot of people pass by this area but a uh, few people know this hidden gem here. And one of the key Lithuanian places here that existed since the 80s 
is a Lithuanian museum. It used to be in Frackville, but um, right now it's in the process of being uh, moved and actually by the time you are watching this video maybe it's already moved to Shenandoah, actually to your building. So mm -hmm. how have you decided to lend your building for a Lithuanian museum and what uh, the visitors will be able to discover here? I happen to uh, have a building that's got some area to it and it will have a better access and uh, then the museum in Frackville and so they will be bringing all of the things they had before which are dolls and jewelry and clothing and linens and books that the Lithuanians brought with them from Lithuania when they first came over here. We also hope to include a lot of things that then were the first generation have. We actually have a piece of stained glass from uh, St. George's. Even though the first Lithuanian Catholic Church was, was demolished by the diocese, uh, we were able to purchase some of the stained glass, so we have a piece of that here. And we'll have different things, different books from local authors, so people can get a little bit of the experience of what it was like when they first came over here. There are still many Lithuanians in the area who want to donate things so that people will know how proud we are of our heritage and they will know how important it was to us. And hopefully this museum will be able to, to make that happen. We have visited the Lithuanian Days this year, which is the oldest annual ethnic festival in America, so uh, the locals said. It was especially impressive to be there and see the Lithuanian traditions continuing still. And it seems that uh, the Lithuanian miners even invented some new traditions here. For example, there is a drink called Boilo that is especially popular here uh, in this area, but uh, nobody heard it in Lithuania, at least by this name but uh, it's considered a Lithuanian drink here. So how, what, what can you tell about the story? Well, for the most part, it's something that's usually made around Christmas or around the holidays. It starts off with usually a whiskey base, perhaps a white or a rye base, and it was called boilo because you would actually boil it just a little bit to get the fruit, the different flavorings in there. Most of the people I knew would give it to each other for Christmas. And every recipe is just a little bit different. Some people would add more cloves, some more cinnamon, some would try to get more fruit. So of course it wouldn't have been Lithuanian because where would they have gotten oranges and lemons in December? And they would also add honey. And I think maybe that's where the Lithuanians get it was, was more like Krupnikus in the fact that it was a little bit sweet, but yet there was a very strong alcohol flavor. Yeah, we have tasted that one as well. Of course, it's all uh, manufactured at home still. There are no like official labels that you could buy. So you have to know some some, some Lithuanians from the area to taste boil. So I'd really like to wish all the best for the Lithuanian Museum here so that people would visit it and learn more about this unique uh, Vilnius of America that's officially now marked by a commemorative plaque uh, that says that it's the little Lithuania of America. It's actually in the center of Shenandoah here. And uh, there are many, many more Lithuanian places uh, in this area. There are actually about a hundred places we have mapped on the Destination Lithuanian America map of Lithuanian heritage here. And the article about uh, Southern Coal region. And there are so many interesting people of Lithuanian heritage to talk to that it's impossible to interview every single one of them. Like, uh, just when going here on the street uh, of this town or Girardel nearby or Tamaqua, we could see Lithuanian flags from time to time. So it's indeed a unique experience uh, to be here. And there will be more interviews from this area. And if you are interested to hear more from the people who live in this unique area, I invite you to follow this YouTube channel. <music>